special episode with Andrew Wilkinson. Andrew Wilkinson started this company called MetaLab, which grew to make tens of millions of dollars. And using the profits from his agency, uh, MetaLab, he eventually bought dozens of more companies. So he's collectively, his companies do hundreds of millions of dollars a year in sales and have created over a billion dollars worth of value. So he's uh, seen a lot of interesting stuff. And in today's episode, we talk about an incredibly success, successful business person that he looks up to. It's our segment called Billy of the Week. And then we talk about some of the ideas that uh, he has for starting and growing companies. He l- currently launched a local news business. So it's kind of like my company, The Hustle, but for different cities. It's very fascinating. I've, I'm asking him if I can join as an advisor. And then he started a few more things and or wants to start more stuff. And he's even said that if you are starting some of these companies to holler at him because he wants to invest. So give it a listen. And by the way, if you're in Miami... Sean and I on June 4th are going to be in Miami. We're doing Austin on June 3rd, but that's already sold out. But June 4th, we have room for up to 400 people. I think already 200 people have RSVP'd. It's free. Um, go to uh, my Twitter handle, the Sampar, and scroll down. You'll see the event uh, Eventbrite link. It's totally free. June 4th, it's Friday. Uh, come. And uh, by the way, we've been working our ass off to make content for you, just for you. Can you do me a favor and click subscribe in iTunes and click follow on Spotify? When you do that, we go higher up in the charts, which means more people can see us, which means we get more views. And if we get more views, we can keep doing this more and more and more because we're uh, making some more money from it and we're able to dedicate more time to this. So please, I work my butt off for you. Just click subscribe and click follow on Spotify and subscribe in iTunes. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the episode. Andrew, what's going on, dude? Hey man, how you doing? Um, I got a so really Andrew, bad, uh, really bad cold. I spent all day yesterday with Kleenex up my nose. So uh, if my voice sounds a little froggy, that's why. It only sounds froggy because you said it sounded froggy. I think you're okay. Um, so Andrew Wilkinson, good friend of mine, good friend of the pod. Is this description that I used three or four weeks ago the same description? Is that is that the same thing? Are you, are you wearing that same personality? Is that the same life, or have you done something new and amazing? Because you're always are pulling something out of your sleeve. Uh, yeah, I've got, I think since then I've launched a couple of businesses actually, but no, the description's still accurate. Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple things. The first thing we're going to talk about is, well, you got a, a bunch of ideas here. I'm excited for the ideas, but I want to talk about Billy of the Week because we talked about two people last time you were here. And that was, uh, it's right next to the biology episode as the most listened episode ever. Really? No way. Yeah. Which, which episode was that? The bill, the one where we did the two billies of the yeah. week? Yeah. yeah. Something Talking. like, I think almost 50,000 people listened to it, which is like, it's an hour long thing. It's a lot of time. Crazy. Um, and then the third most listened thing was the one we did after that. So, you know, it could sign. just be... A, okay. Yeah. So move, aside, uh, move aside, Sean. Yeah. So it's like biology is like, at, whatever it is, you're like within hundreds or like a thousand of it. And then you're the next two. And so that's why I figured we'll start off with that one. But you sent me I yesterday, I asked you to tell me an interesting person, and I'm going to go do a ton of research on them. And I did. And I have a feeling you already know a lot about this person. But what's this? What's this person's name? So his name is, uh, I don't know how to say it. I think it's Jorge, Jorge Paulo. It's Jorge a Brazilian Paulo. name. Jorge Paulo, Brazilian. Oh, there you yeah. go. Okay. Can you say his name, please? And every time we need to say his name, we'll just say Abreu. I'll say his first name. His last name is German, so I don't know if there's a right way of saying it, but his first name is Jorge Paulo. And then but they, um, Paulo is his, considered his first name as well. Because in a lot of the articles I read about him, they call him Jorge, sorry, Jorge Paulo. It might be his middle, Paulo might be his middle name, or it might be like a double first name. I'm not sure, but Jorge Paulo Lemon. Yeah. But anyway, the, the <laughs> he, he, this guy's totally mysterious. He doesn't like to talk about what he does. Uh, there's only a few interviews with him online. Um, but he basically, I mean, if you think about the businesses that he owns, uh, you would know them. So Burger King, uh, Budweiser, Tim Hortons, Kraft Foods, Popeyes, Heinz Ketchup, right? So he basically goes out he finds these amazing, you know, multi-generational businesses that have been around for 50 plus years that do something very, very simple. that's just going to grow over time. He goes out, he usually raises a ton of debt and then he goes and buys them and takes them over. Um, and he's been doing this for, I don't know, 40 years or something like that, starting in Brazil. And let's give a little bit of background of him. Um, so how old is he? He's about 75 years old, right? Um, and he's based out of Brazil. He's a, a Brazilian guy. 
And when he started at the time, I don't think that there were these like Brazilian tycoons. You know, every article that I read about, they said that he was one of the first folks in in Brazil to become one of these uh, uh, private equity or, or Warren Buffett-like people out of Brazil. And like you said, very little is known about him. And he doesn't give interviews. And in a lot of the interviews that I read about him, they said, we actually tried to talk to a bunch of his friends. And nearly all of his friends said, you know, thank you for reaching out. But he's politely asked us not to speak about him in interviews. So he prefers to stay behind the scenes. And it, the way that his career started in, is uh, in 1931, at the age of 32, he had, he had some jobs beforehand where he was a banker. But he started this one bank. Uh, Abreu, you want to help me out here? Here's what it's pronounced. Here's how you pronounce it. You see that right there? It's called G- Garantia. I don't see it. Did you put it in the chat? It's yeah. highlighted. It's, it's highlighted in the, in in the, the doc. doc. Oh, I think it's Garantia or something like that. Garantia. Okay. And okay. it was described as like the Goldman of Brazil. Um, I don't know if it was described at the time like that, but he was 32 when he launched it. It was uh, 1971. And what made it kind of famous was he had a very, uh, I wouldn't call it a laid back culture, but he didn't look at resumes, but instead he looked for uh, what he described as PSD, which was poor, or let me see, what does PSD stand for? Poor, uh, smart, and deep desire to get rich. Yeah, poor, smart, and deep desire to get rich. That's what he looked for, was people who had PSD. And he would hire these folks, and in previously at different companies, you would automatically get a bonus if you were one of the partner, but they created some type of system that was, uh, they tried to make it as mer- based off of merits as much as possible. So a lot of different people could get bonuses. And also the bonuses, you could choose, do you want more stock or do you want more cash? And it was a great way to incentivize people. And it kind of created this iconic culture that that seems what they're uh, they famous for. And it grew to be quite huge. It was something like a billion dollars in profit at one year. But he said that they got cocky and they screwed up. They they overbought some stuff and it eventually went south. And it sold for $650 million, which is a, still a ton of money. But I think it was minuscule compared to how big it got. So I have a question for you, Andrew. And, and then we're going to get into this 3G thing. So then after he sold it for 650 he started buying Gillette stock. And with his other older founders at, at the old company, he started 3G, which was a play on their name. And there was three partners. And they ended up buying uh, Burger King, um, Tim Hortons, all, all the companies that you said. And at this point, he's worth something like $25 billion and one of the, one of the richest people in the world. Um, but I had a ton of questions uh, that about this guy that I think that you might know, or at least you have a better input than I do. The first is how on earth, like when people say they're starting a bank like he did, what's that process like? That sounds so ambiguous and so hard to understand. Well, I think like people hear bank and they think like, oh, a big pile of money like Wells Fargo or something. But bank, the term banker means so many different things. It could be somebody who works at a bank and lends out money or whatever. But a banker is really like a real estate agent for businesses, right? Or for bonds or equities or whatever it is. So it's like a person you go to or a group of people you go to who will figure out problems for you and facilitate transactions. So let's say you, Sam, go, I need to raise $100 million uh, of debt for the hustle because I need to expand. A banker will go out and they will go to all the wealthy people they know and all the different corporations and say, hey, here's this great guy, you should lend him money. And then they take a fee in between. And so in a lot of ways, it's the world's best business. You're a middleman on these huge transactions, multi-billion dollar transactions, and you're taking a two and a half to five percent fee on everything you do. So with like fifty to hundred people, you can do crazy amounts of money. What skill set? So when this guy started at 31, uh, 32, what skill set would he have needed in order to make this happen? Well, it's really heavy on two things. One, it's like sales and stuff, and then the other is kind of financial acumen and modeling and all that. So you'd probably get a bunch of people in the office who are like super hardcore spreadsheet junkie Excel types who can like figure out, you know, how to structure a deal. And then you'd also have people who can do the very high level sales, right? So they're basically smooth talking and calling and selling and positioning everything to facilitate all the deals. Do you consider yourself a banker? No, I actually generally really hate dealing with bankers. Um, and I, I think it's kind of like real estate agents, right? Like I'm very skeptical of real estate agents. I think in the next 50 years, they probably won't exist. 
a lot of the time a real estate agent is just a person who puts up a listing online for you, opens the door for a few people, and then takes a huge fee, which seems crazy and out of line, right? And and now there's great real estate agents. Let's say you have a weird property that might not sell. They know how to spruce it up. There's one, there's one in a hundred that's amazing and will sell your property for more. But a lot of the time they're useless. And the same thing is kind of true with bankers. I think if you've got a great business and you want to raise money, uh, you should just go and call a bunch of wealthy people and try and raise the money yourself. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the time what bankers do is build some decks and then breathe on the phone while you talk to other people and then take a huge fee. How much money have you raised? Uh, we've raised maybe, to, uh, well, it depends, on, it depends on how you think about it. So um, I would say in the neighborhood of about two, 200, 250 million or something like that, if you include our IPO. Or our reverse takeover we just did? Not including that. What's it? 100? 200 maybe. Oh, so the, the SPAC that you did wasn't a significant Not, not including. Of- it was 60 million. That was, that was how much we raised when we took that business public. Wow. So then your funds have well over 100. Yeah. And you didn't use a banker for any of that? No. We just called people we knew. I mean, we had we bumbled into this world. Like I had no idea... Five years ago, six years ago, even I didn't know what the difference between a banker and a bank teller was. I had no idea. Um, and because of that, we just kind of kept meeting interesting business people. And as we met interesting business people, they'd keep saying, Hey, are you guys raising money? Because I'd love to invest with you. And so eventually, when we had big enough deals that were interesting and we wanted partners, I just called those people and we did it ourselves. So back to this guy, he uh, like when you're starting something like this, and and this is I, you like this guy because I imagine like you 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 kind of want to you want to steal some of his life, right? I mean, you want to you want you 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 want to emulate some parts that he's done, yeah. Well, I think like we're probably similar in that like we're both attracted to these really simple businesses like selling beer or razors. Like there's both of us come from like this weird tech world where we do this like knowledge work. You you write an email newsletter, I do a design, and then two years later it doesn't exist, right? I like yeah. the longevity and the the kind of simplicity of more traditional businesses. So I love that. And I think the idea of just buying these super safe, boring, steady eddy businesses that do something simple in the world and just making them better actually sounds like a lot of fun. And I wrote a note below, but the key thing about that, what he does is um, generally they have one key insight, right? So it'll be something as simple as when they bought Budweiser, it was on the third generation. They'd gotten super rich, right? So it was like the first generation built it. The second generation like were amazing. They went to Harvard. They grew it. The third generation took over. They got sloppy, didn't really care about growth. They had fancy offices and private jets and stuff. And so when they bought it, they just look at it and go, oh, it's been run in a kind of a sloppy way and they've lost their discipline. We can buy it with a lot of debt and then we can just make it way better, pay off our debt, and then we own Budweiser. And so it's this crazy coup for these guys from Brazil who, you know, they came from basically, uh, you know, started at zero, although I think they were, you know, upper middle class in Brazil. But starting there to owning Budweiser is crazy. And I want to ask you about how to get into those deals. And, and when I read about him, it sounded like he was the young guy of a three-person partnership, um, which definitely I think helped. he's actually the old guy. So there's the two oh, younger shit? guys. Wow. The younger guys actually go and they run the businesses. So like one of the partners, I believe, went in and runs, um, runs uh, what is it called? QSR, which is like owns Tim Hortons and all that stuff. Sorry, I meant from his first thing. So his first thing got him his big nut. His first thing yeah. made him like six fifty, or they sold for six fifty. And from what it sounded like, it was like a a, a little bit of an older guy who had a little bit been there, done that, kind of brought him along. And he was the young guy of that partnership. Totally, um, yeah. And then he did the same thing, and now he has younger partners. Right, and um, and so I have a, I had a few questions about this, but I wanted to so let's just talk about this guy's strategy at three G and and his whole life. It seems he's done the same thing, which is he's. A cheapskate. He's frugal. He's incredibly frugal. Um, so he's done a couple of things. Like he has a few like phrases that they would say, which is like, he's like, costs are like fingernails. You have to cut them constantly. And he would do famous things like when they bought Burger King, they banned color copies, meaning when you're using the photocopy machine, uh, he was like, just black and white only. Um, you also, what, what was this thing you said about private jets? They, fo- they also forced people to print on both sides. They'd say, you not only can you not print color, but you have to print double-sided. 
Um, so the first thing they would always do whenever they buy a business is they sell all the private jets immediately, right? And let's let's be real, most Fortune 500 companies have like between one and ten private jets, and they just say f that, we don't need those. They sell them, and it's kind of a statement. And then from that point on, the new CEO and all the executives they have to fly economy and they have to stay in motels. And Dude, they all crazy. they it's I love that, right? I think it just sets the tone from the top in a really interesting way. And these are people, I mean, the CEO of AB InBev, he's probably worth like hundreds of millions of dollars and he's staying at like a quality inn. But I think there's something to demonstrating that at the top if you want your lower lower level employees to care too. I actually think that that's a stupid thing. So I get staying at cheap hotels because staying at, staying at like a Marriott Courtyard, which is like an $89 a thing, I'm on board with that. It's probably even cheaper than somebody's 50 bucks. I'm cool with that. It's just that you can have a fine, clean, comfortable place. Although I do like having room service because if you get into a place late, you want that. But whenever these people say they fly economy, I'm like, that's kind of stupid. If I'm flying overnight, I need a comfortable, I need to be comfortable so I could like be ready to roll. You know, you're like, you don't want your athlete to like work off two hours sleep. Um, 